Hey everyone. Um, as was said, I'm Annalise Meyer. I'm from the University of Victoria, just up the coast in BC. Uh, thanks to the conveners for a great session so far. Uh, today I'll be discussing rare earth element distributions in the oligotrophic gyre of the Sargasso Sea, so that's the subtropical North Atlantic, and their influence on aerobic bacterial methanotrophy. We developed this project over the past uh, year as a collaboration between University of Victoria and the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science, which, yes, is a great place to do field work. Um, so over the past couple of field seasons, thank you, um, we've been looking at the vertical distribution of rare earth elements throughout the entire water column at the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series, sta st series Station, or BATS, uh, which is about 4.5 kilometers water depth. Uh, we've also been looking at the dissolved methane profiles, dissolved nitrous oxide profiles, and begun to assess the genetic and metabolic properties of marine methylotrophs and methanotrophs. Now hopping over to land, uh, this is Solfatara in Italy. Uh, it's a geothermal thermal site where Methylacetophyllum fumariolicum solvi was first discovered. And the interesting thing about this organism is that it required direct mud pot water from this region of Italy to allow its growth. And there was some confusion about why exactly this was, and it eventually was narrowed down to the presence of lanthanides in the water. And th this marked this organism, uh, discovered by Polate al., as the first organism to require rare earth elements for life. So uh, they managed to grow this continuously, oh my god, <laughs> uh, continuously in culture uh, using lanthanide supplemented tap water. Um, if I added tap water to my cultures, I'd probably be fired, but you know, there you have it. Uh, so this was only found in 2007, and before 1985, there wasn't any sort of speculation that biogeochemical cycling of rare earth elements might exist whatsoever. Uh, in 1985, de Bardel proposed that maybe there was passive scavenging of rare earth elements onto biological particles in the water column, but any sort of active metabolic role for these organisms wasn't even in the picture. So I'll run quickly through the biochemical basis for rare, rare earth element uh, requirement for methanotrophy before getting into the results and implications of this research for astrobiology. Uh, so methanotrophs oxidize methane through a multi-step pathway and they either assimilate it into biomass or dissimilate it into CO2 uh, through a couple different pathways that distinguish the types of methanotrophs. Uh, each oxidation step produces quinones and electron carriers to provide reducing power for ATP generation. Uh, so this is a multi-step pathway, but I'm just going to be focusing on methanol dehydrogenase today. So this protein is the X-ray crystallography structure of one subunit of the homodimeric XOXF methanol dehydrogenase isoform uh, from the previously mentioned mud pot organism. As you can see, this version uses a PQQ cofactor and a cerium ion in its active site. Uh, other methanotrophic species have been noted to use other rare earth elements, but what I particularly want you to note here is that it's only the light rare earth elements, so cerium, lanthanum, occasionally europium, that have ever been observed. Um, so there is some confusion as to why this is and to, uh, and to why these rare earth elements are at all incorporated into these organisms. Uh, before 2007, the only isoform of methanol dehydrogenase known used uh, calcium in its active site, which is pretty commonly used in metalloenzymes, um, and is very abundant in both the ocean and other, other environments. Uh, it's thought that perhaps rare earth elements, um, as they are better Lewis acids than calcium, might provide more efficient catalysts, but it's still unclear as to the regulation of these two isoforms. And in most methanotrophs, both isoforms are found. So to set the stage for our sampling, I've just got some section plots of the um, transect between Bermuda and Puerto Rico from September 2018. So as you can see, it's... Uh, fairly oxic, and extremely saline, warm, and extremely oligotrophic. And this red arrow here just indicates the location of bats. Um, these plots are all interpolated from CTD data. Um, so uh, bottle data was used to um, calibrate these. Now to zoom in on fluorescence, uh, this green arrow here, arrow here highlights the deep chlorophyll max. And that's generally where we expect to find the most photosynthetic biomass. However, we expect to find methanotrophs sitting slightly lower, around 300 meters. Uh, there's higher nutrient concentrations there, lower oxygen levels, which is preferred by type 1 methanotrophs, and most importantly, it's well out of the euphotic zone. Uh, many methanotrophs are light inhibited, so this is a pretty strict requirement. Now, the location of both the chlorophyll max and the methanotroph max 
will vary seasonally, uh, primarily due to the deep storm mixing in the winter. Um, so this mixed layer, uh, shown by this black line here, uh, drives the mixed layer much deeper in the winter, and summer stratification shallows it uh, quite dramatically. Uh, so this deep winter storm mixing will drive the um, me methane concentrations from atmospheric exchange deeper, um, probably also allowing the methanotrophs to sit a little bit deeper, deeper. So now that we've gone over the dissolved gas chemistry of this area, we'll dig into the depth of the matter, which is the rare earth element distributions. So all of our samples were collected in GeoTrace's clean bottles, so that's essentially a several month cleaning process to prevent any sort of trace metal contamination. Um, then pre-concentrated on a chelating resin column. The functional groups are pictured here. It works equally well for trace metals and rare earth elements and uh, analyzed with ICPMS. So we got profiles that looked pretty consistently like this. Um, I've only highlighted the rare earth elements of particular interest to us in these profiles. So that's lanthanum and cerium and contrasted them against a heavier rare earth element, ytterbium. So you can see that ytterbium has quite a static profile. Uh, whereas both cerium and lanthanum exhibit this drawdown feature sitting around 300 meters. So cerium does continue to drop, and that's due to its nature as a redox species. So any sort of nutrient-like effects of cerium are masked by this redox profile. However, lanthanum does exhibit a shockingly nutrient-like profile, especially if you view it from 300 meters down rather than from the surface, as is usual. This behavior was conserved throughout our entire autumn time series. Um, we did get an interesting mid-depth intrusion in lanthanum that w appeared on October and persisted into November. Um, we're still looking into that with sediment trap data, but it's likely a water mass movement effect rather than microbially mediated, so we're not gonna dig too deeply into it today. Now things get really interesting when we normalize the light rare earth elements to a heavier rare earth element. So in this case, we've taken uh, lanthanum, cerium, and neodymium and normalized them to the ytterbium profile. So this deep profile becomes a lot more static, indicating what happens in the deep is likely uh, conserved across the entire lanthanide suite and not microbially mediated. But that 300 meter um, drawdown feature that I called your attention to earlier becomes even more pronounced. So this light rare earth element drawdown effect has been observed before um, by Alan Schiller et al. in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon blowout. Uh, so these red dots here are from early May 2010, the blue triangles from late May 2010, and um, the yellow diamonds from October 2011, but a year and a half after the accident when the, um, when the water column uh, returned to normal. <laughs> so you can see that uh, Lanthanum is preferentially drawn down around 1,100 meters, and that's where there's this intrusion of natural gas. Uh, Schiller et al. did also note that XOXF methanol dehydrogenase was being expressed particularly in this area. So to, that's the uh, cerium or lanthanum bearing isoform of methanol dehydrogenase. So that's indicating that this methanol, methane oxidize, oxidation is driving this drawdown. Uh, so this drawdown bears a striking similarity to that drawdown feature that we're noting in our, uh, in our rare earth element profiles. And just note that uh, the scale has changed in, uh, in these depth profiles. So as the deepwater horizon drawdown around 1100 meters was caused by this methane oxidation, this gives us decent reason to believe that this drawdown is also caused by methane oxidation and the expression of this XOXF gene. So these are at wildly different depths, and that reflects the control of methane concentration. Uh, we're working on getting those methane profiles ready for print so that we can actually correlate um, the rare earth element concentrations to the methane in the water column. So the weight of this only comes when we can actually prove that it's uh, methane oxidation causing this uh, light rare earth element drawdown effect. This portion of our research is still in, our, in its infancy, but our preliminary methods for enriching communities with meth uh, methanotrophs and methylotrophs have shown some success. Uh, so far, we've been purging cultures with uh, methane and nitrogen and uh, growing them up on solid supplemented seawater media under a methane mixed air atmosphere. And that gave us enough growth to do some preliminary DNA extractions and PCR just to detect whether or not these genes are even present. So we probed these methane cultures with um, primers designed to target the five main clades of XOXF genes as defined by Tabard et al. in 2015. 
And this gave us a decently strong signal from XOXF5. Uh, there was also smaller signals from XOXF1 and 2, um, but those were inconclusive, so we're going to look a little further into that. So this showed us that at the very least, organisms carrying these XOXF genes are present in the water column at uh, where this sample was taken, which is 300 meters. Whether or not uh, this is being expressed in any abundance is still yet to be determined, and we're looking into that. But for a first step, uh, this was really promising. So the final piece to discuss today is the use of this light rare earth element fractionation as a lasting metabolic signature. So this is a principal component analysis for the molar ratios of lanthanum, cerium, and neodymium in samples of ancient hydrocarbon seeps from Fang et al. in 2009, uh, ranging in age from the Middle Devonian to the Oligocene. I've also compared it to a variety of chon oh, uh, <laughs> chondritic meteorites uh, just to provide some uh, scale. Uh, ch chondritic meteorites are often used for rare earth element normalization uh, <coughs> instead of the heavier rare earth elements that we've been using here. And as you can see, these oxic seeps highlighted, sorry, these anoxic seeps highlighted in red, um, which were inferred from a negative cerium anomaly, as well as the presence of aminopentol, which is a bacterial helping polyol that um, allows for the positive identification of aerobic methanotrophy. Uh, these anoxic seep, uh, seep sites do group more or less away from the oxic seep sites. And it seems to have to do with the enrichment of lanthanum in these rocks. So our proposed explanation for this is that um, organisms which are performing aerobic methanotrophy will selectively uptake lanthanum from the water column to perform, or perform this aerobic methane oxidation. And once lanthanum is bound to these biological particles, will be more easily buried and solidified uh, as, these, as these reactions are occurring at the sea floor. So to wrap things up, uh, if these, as these rare earth elements are so insoluble in water, why has this XOXF gene been so prolific and so persistent? Um, why has it persisted through the, the evolution of methanotrophs? And it is noted to be present in almost all methanotrophs that have been studied in, um, in combination with the normal calcium-bearing isoform. Uh, some explanations we have thought of are that perhaps uh, methanotrophs originated in some uh, some environment in which rare earth elements were more abundant, like perhaps certain hot springs or hydrothermal vents. I'm not going to comment on which I think it is because it'll get me in trouble. Um, or perhaps um, the XOXF gene was simply the first version of this isoform and the ability to use the more abundant calcium evolved later. Um, if you'd like to talk about phylogeny, please fi find me later because there's some interesting thoughts on that. Um, however, the most interesting part of this research from my perspective is not only the insight that uh, these organisms can give us on the marine methane cycle, but the idea that this light rare earth element fractionation might be useful as a lasting metabolic signature throughout geologic time, and the insight that the role rare earth elements played in meth and methanotroph, um, methanotroph evolution might give us about the origin and colonization of life on Earth. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, note my appreciation for my collaborators, Jay Cullen and Damien Grundle, as well as everyone else who's helped me so much on this project, and NSERC and the Canadian Associates of BIOS for my funding. And with that, I'll take any questions. Have you started to do competition studies with these to see if there's any like preference? Do they always go for the calcium isoform if you've introduced um, both? So it, I just was wondering if you had, um, you know, any kind of direct competition where you could give ample uh, metal availability to see if there's a, a preference um, biologically. Yeah. So that's um, that's in the works. We haven't yet started that as we've just. Um, my last week in the lab was when we managed to get these actually growing po um, properly. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, particularly rate with these two, with the expression of each enzyme. Um, so we're doing some heavy isotope analysis with um, provided methane, and hopefully that'll give some idea of which is, um, which is the preference and which enzyme is actually more efficient. Um, my intuition would lead to the rare earth element bearing isoform being more efficient uh, given that it's uh, 
characteristic as a stronger Lewis acid, but we'll see. So we had one more question here, and the one in the back, and that'll be it for the session. Thank you. Nice talk, Annalise. That was great. Um, so there's been some work showing that um, certain groups of microbes will actually take up tellurium, mm. but it's unclear kind of what its fate is. So the, I guess the first question is, you've shown us some data on some of the, some of the lanthanides. Uh, have you been able to extend it and look at, at, at some of the other lanthanides, or um, is that on your radar? Yes, yeah, so we've, we've analyzed for um, the suite of 16 lanthanides and chemically similar elements. Um, these are the ones that showed the most dramatic uh, differences. The heavier rare earth elements beyond europium really show more of the profile that I showed, like euterbium, that's pretty static throughout the water column. Uh, and all of the structural analysis that's been done on XOXF genes, uh, sorry, XOXF proteins, have shown um, only lanthanum and cerium, occasionally neodymium being used, and one analysis yeah. artificially used europium and got a slightly lower rate, but it did still uh, catalyze, but uh -huh. the heavier ones don't seem to be used. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to ask a question about how we think about uh, the preservation of these genes that in the local environment seem to be strange, um, and whether or not this should be providing us information about the sort of global suite of circumstances that organisms may be reflecting. If we think about vent organisms, we find that, for instance, mat formers and endosymbionts at vents all around the world are more closely related to each other than they mm -hmm. are to anything somewhere else. And so I wonder if something slow like the complete abandonment of a gene might occur on timescales so much slower than organism sample environments all over the world that what we're seeing is an averaging over ecosystems of many different types, even when we sample things that seem to be locally adapted. Is, is that reasonable given what you know about these systems? I would say that's a very good thought. Um, based on some very preliminary uh, sequence analysis of these genes, it does seem like um, they are being preserved fairly well. There ha there's been, uh, between uh, XOSF genes from many different environments, the sequence similarity is quite shocking. Um, there's more sequence similarity between XOXF genes um, of diverse organisms than there is between um, the very conserved um, MXA or calcium-bearing isoform of the same organism. So for context, those two genes are over 15%, sorry, over 50% identical at the amino acid level. And at the active site level, there's only one amino acid different between calcium and um, whichever light wear earth element is being used. However, between uh, XOSF bearing isoforms, that sequence identity jumps up to 80%. Uh, so I would, I would say at the moment it's hard to say whether or not we're getting a slow fading out of these genes uh, versus some sort of other reason to maintain them, uh, but it's definitely something to look at. Okay. All right, thank you, Annalise.